Hi everyone, uh, I think we'll begin. I hope everyone is logged on by now. Thank you very much for joining us for the last session in the Climate Ethics Series, which has been run this term with the philosophy faculty of Oxford and in conjunction with the Oxford Climate Society. In this series, we've brought um, four talks to you, the fourth one today, uh, the first with Henry Xu, uh, sorry, John Broom, then Megan Blomfield, then Henry Xu. We've heard topics ranging from uh, self-interest against climate change to responsibilities in an unjust world and CO2 removal. Today, we're gonna to be hearing from Simon Caney on power, political responsibilities and climate change. I'm gonna be moderating the session. My name is Alice Evett. I'm a DPhil student here at Oxford working on climate ethics. I'm also the outreach director for the Oxford Climate Society. So Simon Caney is the professor of political theory at the University of Warwick. He's worked extensively on climate change and uh, climate justice. Uh, some of his work has touched on issues such as uh, the nature of a just transition in a low carbon future. He's currently working on his latest book with the Oxford University Press on cosmopolitanism, uh, equality, ecology and resistance. He's also currently working on ways of making democratic political systems less prone to short termism and better equipped to govern for the long term, which couldn't be more relevant to uh, topics and discussions of climate ethics. So today we'll be hearing his talk, which will go for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have the floor open to questions from the audience. So as always, please uh, use the live chat feature on YouTube to post any and all questions you have, and I'll try my best to get through all of them. Also today, which is different from the last sessions, uh, Simon also has a handout. I've posted a link uh, to that handout underneath um, the live stream, which you can see on the description of the video. I'll also post it uh, very soon on the live chat feature. So without further ado, um, over to you, Simon. Okay. Can you uh, can you hear me? Okay. Simon, that's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Alice, for organising this and for all you've done to make this possible. Uh, and um, I'm a novice at giving a talk on, on Zoom, so I apologize for any hiccups that will uh, arise or if they do arise. Okay, so with no more ado, um, the, uh, the focus of this is talk is on what I want to call political responsibilities to uh, tackle climate change. And um, people often you know, refer to responsibilities in the context of climate change. So for example, people sometimes say, well, what, what's my personal responsibility? Uh, should I limit my own emissions? Uh, should I not fly? Or if I fly, should I off offset? Uh, should I not eat uh, meat and uh, dairy products? Should I become a vegan? Uh, should I not have children? Um, so these I'm gonna call issues of personal responsibility and I'm not going to say uh, anything about them in my talk, though maybe it'll arise with Q&A. There's another way in which the concept of responsibility sometimes gets used in discussions of uh, climate ethics. Uh, and Alice mentioned a talk by Megan Blomfield, I think a fortnight ago, uh, where sometimes people use the language of responsibility to refer to who ought to pay for costs of mitigating and adapting to climate change. And the thought is, well, um, we're talking here about people's duties, uh, duties to, to pay for clean technology, um, duties to compensate people harmed, and, and duties are responsibilities. And so that's, that's another way people use the word responsibility. 
But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about uh, what I'm calling political responsibilities, which are responsibilities to, as I put it, change the economic, social, and political structures within which people live their lives. So that, that's what I mean. And obviously I'm using uh, politics uh, quite broadly there. Okay. So, um, you know, what would you want if you uh, were after a theory of political responsibilities? Uh, here are six things that I think you would need to know. The first and the one that I'll spend most time talking about is the content of political responsibilities. So suppose someone says to me, uh, well, I hear people saying I should take political action, but what is it that I actually should do? What are the actions I should perform? That's the content. A second question might be, well, what are the kinds of entities that have these responsibilities? Is it just the jobs of governments or is it corporations? Um, is it individuals? So what are the relevant units? I I'm gonna assume that it's all of the above and it includes individuals. So I'm talking about me and you. A third question you might ask about political responsibility is, so let's suppose that individuals have these, but which individuals? Um, is it all individuals have them or just some? And then a fourth question you might ask is to put it very bluntly, you know, who should do what? Uh, what's the, the distribution or alloc allocation of political responsibilities? I mean, you might think, for example, some people's uh, role is, is to lead and take action and other people's political responsibilities is to support them and enable them. Uh, a fifth question um, is you might ask, well, what are the limits on what I can be expected to do? And then a final one is, you know, what, what means may I or may I not use to, um, in the struggle to kind of create a more sustainable world. So I'm not, you'll be relieved to know, trying to answer all of those. I'm really gonna focus mainly on one. And then in the light of that, say something about questions three, four, and five. And I think it's really crucial to, to have a, a good grasp of the content before you do anything else. So here's an, another point I just wanna make before I, uh, launch into what I think. Um, I think one thing that is quite striking is that philosophers um, have discussed climate ethics a great deal and an increasing amount, but there isn't really very much of an, uh, uh, sort of systematic account of our political responsibilities. Um, so sometimes people are just silent on it. They just talk about other things like the fair distribution of burdens and benefits. Um, that, that's fine, uh, you know, we can specialize in some things but not look at others. But um, as a discipline as a whole, it would be disappointing if there's just silence. And then often we get incomplete statements like, well, governments ought to mitigate. Well, I think that's true, but many of them don't. Um, and what responsibilities do other actors have, like citizens, to uh, encourage them to mitigate? Um, so just boldly saying governments ought to mitigate assumes that political responsibilities only fall to actors like governments and it's silent on what should happen if governments don't. So that's inadequate and incomplete. And then sometimes there are just quite vague statements. I'm, I'm sure I've said uh, some things along this line, which are, well, look, there are just duties to develop institutions. And so some might reach for the Rawlsian mantra of, well, there's a natural duty of justice to uphold and to further just institutions. I mean, I think there's, there's two things problematic about that. One is it's very vague. If a citizen asked me, uh, what should I do about climate change? What are my political responsibilities? And I say that, I think they're entitled to be disappointed that I haven't said anything more specific. And it's also too narrow. I don't think institutions are the only things that matter. Now, some people do develop things uh, along the lines of an account of political responsibilities. And I've quoted a passage here from Liz Cripps's book. 
um, highlighting what she thinks people ought to do. But my worry about this, uh, and I'm not going to read it out because you hopefully can see it all, my worry about this is it's not at all systematic. It doesn't start from an account of what needs to change politically and then work back from that as to who should do what. So uh, although I probably agree with quite a lot of the things she says, it strikes me as, as ad hoc and um, not systematic. Uh, I'm also pretty skeptical that sending emails to the current prime minister of the UK or the US president uh, or the president of China is gonna have uh, any efficacy. So I don't think we have a systematic account of political responsibilities. So I'm gonna begin with a methodological point. Uh, and that's this, to answer the citizen who says to me, well, what are my political responsibilities? I think our starting point has to be that we have to have an, an accurate understanding of the kinds of change that are required and how social and political transformations occur. We're living in political systems and social and economic systems that are not designed to tackle climate change. There needs to be a, a radical economic, social and political transformation. And I think the first thing we therefore need to know is uh, sort of what needs to be done and how can we get from here to there. So to my mind that the clearest kind of analytical framework for thinking about this comes from uh, the, the late uh, sociologist Eric Olin Wright, uh, particularly in his book, uh, Envisioning Real Utopias. Now, uh, uh, Wright was a socialist and he um, was trying to provide an account of how people could advance the cause of socialism. Uh, I don't think anything that he says there or that I'm about to use um, requires that, those kinds of commitments. So what he says is that if we're thinking about how to bring about structural change and political change, we need four ingredients or four components. Firstly, we need an account of the obstacles uh, to transformation. Now, how are the unjust arrangements able to perpetuate themselves? So in red, I've put the, the climate variant of this is what political factors maintain the current ecologically unsustainable status quo? So what are, what are the forces sustaining that? Secondly, uh, we need to know what are the points of vulnerability? What are the possibilities of transformation? So what opportunities are there to bring about a transformation to a, a low carbon or a zero carbon world? Third thing is we need an account of change. We need to think, well, how will the obstacles and the possibilities be likely to evolve uh, in the near future? And then fourthly, we need an account of the strategies by which agents can exploit the possibilities and overcome the obstacles to bring about a better state of affairs. Now, uh, as I'll say um, a bit later, Wright talks about three kinds of strategy. Um, but I'll postpone that for a moment. The next thing I want to kind of say is to do all of this, I think we need a good, strong grasp uh, of the political dynamics. Um, what I don't think we can do is sort of speculate in an a priori way, um, have our own folk theory about how change can take place. We, we need to draw on the relevant social scientific literatures. And I've cited some of the authors there from sociology and anthropology and history to political science and energy studies. Okay, so I'm gonna try and draw on that um, and uh, sketch out how I think um, we could have a political transformation to a sustainable world. Obviously, everything I say here is uh, Kind of eminently contestable. So if you think I've misunderstood the political dynamics, then you know, let me know. I, I need to know that. Okay, so I want to begin then just thinking what are the obstacles, right? So obstacle number one 
is that there are powerful actors who have consistently thwarted attempts to pass environmental legislation. I think many people are familiar with the work of Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway on how fossil fuel companies have funded disinformation campaigns. Uh, much more recently, there's been some interesting work by uh, the political scientist uh, Leah Stokes on uh, how fossil fuel industries and electric utilities uh, operating in the US have thwarted climate legislation in states like California and Texas. Um, there's an, another interesting book by uh, Matto Mildenberger called Carbon Captured, which looks at the US, Australia, and Norway, and, and argues that there's what he calls double representation, that it's not just fossil fuel companies, it's also labor unions um, who have fought against climate legislation. So if we're thinking about obstacles, it seems like one obvious candidate is the way fossil fuels have used their resources for political power. Um, here are you know, four other obstacles. Uh, I mean, one is just the power of inertia. Um, if you think about the layouts of towns and cities, if you think about the way buildings are designed, these have an enormous impact on people's emissions. Uh, to give you one uh, illustration of this, I read a study of emissions in 2004, which compared transport emissions in Barcelona with transport emissions in uh, Georgia, Atlanta. And the, the figure for Georgia, Atlanta was 10 times per person than it was for Barcelona. Why? Well, because one of them is geographically incredibly dispersed, whereas the other, Barcelona, um, is compressed, dense, and has a public transit system. So sometimes people you know, point their fingers at individuals and say you should reduce your emissions, but a huge amount of this is beyond individual agency. It operates at the level of infrastructure. Not only that, but infrastructure has huge impacts um, in the future. Uh, it locks people in. Um, so if you look at that quotation I've given from the IPCC's uh, fifth assessment report, you know, it tells us that infrastructure and technology choices made immediately after the Second World, World War are still exerting an impact on people's um, behaviors. So unless societies redesign towns and cities, and provide public transit. They lock their citizens um, into high emissions lifestyles for decades to come. Uh, I think you know, many people ignore infrastructure because as uh, some sociologists astutely observed, it's largely invisible to people. We rarely think about it until it breaks down. So I think this is a, a major obstacle that we've got a, a social and economic world built in ways that are dysfunctional um, and that needs changing. And then just more, more briefly, you could think there are three other types of obstacle. There are social norms and, and practices which can lead to unsustainability. So Elizabeth Shove, who I've uh, put down there, gives an example of the cultural norm expecting people in business to wear suits, which requires them, given how hot it is in many parts of the world, to have air conditioned offices, which then requires high emissions. Um, but if we change our cultural practices and tell people they don't have to wear suits, then immediately um, one kind of pressure for unsustainability is reduced. Um, other factors you might think about obstacles are just prevailing ideologies. It's rare to find uh, a politician who says, that they are opposed to economic growth. Um, so hegemonic ideas about limitless economic growth are, I think, another obstacle. And you might think, I certainly think that our political systems are entirely dysfunctional for dealing with um, climate change. They're too short term and they have uh, no incentives within them to care about the plights of non-citizens. So if we're trying to craft an account of political responsibilities, then I think our starting point has to be here's a bunch of obstacles that foster and sustain unsustainability. Well, are there possibilities for transformation? Uh, well, one might be 
Yeah, there are potential coalitions of people who would benefit from climate legislation. So IPCC reports are, are full of the co-benefits of climate legislation. Um, people will have better health because um, air pollution is lower, for example. So that's one kind of uh, element on the side of possibilities. Uh, think also about you know, powerful actors within the current system who will be harmed by climate change. Think about the insurers who are extremely worried about having to pay high dividends or just going out of business. Um, think about investors worried about assets becoming stranded. Uh, you know, potentially these are our sources of strength for change. And then you might think, well, there are some features of the status quo which are so ideologically vulnerable that they constitute a weak link. So for me, you know, fossil fuel subsidies is, is a good example of this. Uh, there are massive subsidies of fossil fuels. See, see the figures from Cody that I put there. Um, you know, 6.5 percent of global GDP. Uh, and what we're doing there is spending taxpayers' money not on clean energy, but making a severe problem even worse. And it can't even be defended on the grounds that uh, they tackle things like fuel poverty because they're generally regressive. And I think from all different ideological points of view, uh, these are vulnerable to critique. Here's another thing you might think of it under the heading of um, prospects for change is there are existing elements of the institutional architecture that people might be able to use to leverage uh, a more sustainable future. So think, for example, of the Paris Agreement. Article 14 says in there that uh, there should be a global stock take um, every five years, at which parties are required to declare what they've done to reduce their emissions. I think this is something that NGOs, well, they can and they do use as ways of holding actors accountable um, to try and, and mobilize uh, support of more demanding targets and use this as a way of putting pressure on governments. Okay, so that, that those will be sorts of things that you might think of as elements of, uh, of um, that give us pathways to change. And then the final, so the third element of uh, Eric Olin Wright's framework was, well, you know, what about the future? What, what about the dynamic features that might be changing? And obviously COVID has climate implications and in particular, the effect of COVID and the lockdown on companies leaving them, you know, financially extremely vulnerable. They lack the kind of power they normally have. And there's a ripe opportunity therefore to bail out firms only if and because and to the extent that they um, are bound to meeting stringent climate targets. Uh, and I, I've cited there something from Cameron Hepburn and colleagues of his uh, that's forthcoming on the kinds of things that he thinks uh, are ripe policies to propose at this juncture because um, they uh, overcome the, you know, the economic depression that we're facing, um, but are also uh, clear steps towards a more sustainable future. Okay, so what I've tried to give there is an account of the political landscape, as I see it, of what are the obstacles, what are the possibilities, what are the aspects of change. The fourth and final element of, of Eric Olin Wright's account was the political strategies that actors can use to exploit the possibilities. And he mentions three kinds, uh, what he calls ruptural, interstitial, and symbiotic strategies. The ruptural is the confrontational. You try and overthrow the current system. That doesn't mean violently. It just means uh, get rid of, let's say, the carbon economy. Then there's interstitial, which uh, tries to work within the existing system, but uh, provide an account of the future that we should be trying to work towards. And then there's symbiotic, which is strategies which work with some accounts of the existing system in the pursuit of joint aims. 
So that's quite abstract. Let me try and put some flesh on those bones. So that the political strategies that would be ruptural would be things like campaigning for the eradication of fossil fuel subsidies, campaigning for divestment from fossil fuel companies, campaigning for carbon taxes, campaigning for um, uh, investment in clean technology. It's you know, a direct attack on a carbon-based economy. Interstitial ones, I think the best example I can think of are things like transition towns. And, and that's where people decide to try and uh, create a public space like their town in ways that prefigure the future they're trying to create. So uh, they try and create models of what uh, sustainable societies look like as an inspiration to others that it can be done, that it's desirable, that it's feasible. And then there are what you can call symbiotic political strategies, which work with elements of the status quo. And you know, a good example here is given by uh, two long-standing experts on climate politics, Peter Newell and Matthew Patterson. And they, they write, as you can see, uh, it's clear that given the, the neoliberal context we live in, mobilizing the money of private investors, uh, most of whom are large institutional investors like insurance companies and pension funds, that, they say, will be crucial to achieving the transformation to a low carbon economy. So in short, if you want investment in clean technologies, you're going to have to work with these bodies. You know, and some representatives like Mark Carney have clearly been very actively campaigning in this sort of vein. OK, so that's my sort of understanding of what a political transition um, would look like it would have those component parts in. But someone might now say, yeah, okay, but who has what political responsibilities? What, what does this mean for me? And now I want to kind of focus in on that kind of line of reasoning. And I think, you know, the best way to begin is to think about what any account of political responsibilities ought to uh, do. I think there are two criteria. One is we should try and think about what would best realize a just transition, given all of the factors I've just mentioned. Um, that's A. And then B, uh, what's fair to the duty bearers? You know, we don't want to put unreasonable burdens on people or unfair comparative burdens on people. So let's just think if if we start with A and we think, well, what would best realize a just, just transition? Then um, I think the obvious kind of guiding principle here would be that those who have power have a responsibility to use that to bring about the sort of transformation I described earlier. So uh, yeah, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, familiar to many as what Uncle Ben says to Spider-Man. Uh, but I think it is kind of very hard to disagree with this as a general maxim with a, the qualifier I'll add in a minute. So it definitely seems implausible to ascribe political responsibilities to those um, who don't have any power and can't have any power. Um, whereas those who can steer us on the path to a more sustainable world. Um, I would have to give a pretty powerful justification as to why, although they have the power to do this, they are choosing not to do that. So I think for all the kind of opportunities I mentioned before, those who have the greatest um, capability to affect change um, have a responsibility to do that. Okay, um, but what if I lack power? Well, then I think to put it a bit too crudely, there may be a responsibility to become powerful or more accurately to become part of something that does have political power. So let me just try and illustrate the kind of things I have in mind there. So someone listening to this may be a student and they may think, well, I don't have any political power, but, but students have student unions and student unions have power. Student unions can call for divestment and therefore, if we're thinking of the obstacles, that will weaken fossil fuel companies. Um, uh, workers 
well, on your own, you don't have power, but as a member of a union, you can have power and unions can campaign for green jobs and help create a coalition for change um, so that any uh, sustainable transition um, doesn't come at the cost of people's jobs. Those who have pensions on your own, uh, you or I or we don't have power, but as members uh, of a company or pension company we do because we can press uh, at annual general meetings for their representatives to divest from fossil fuels. Um, I put a load of other examples on the document, hopefully you can see whether you're a journalist or an NGO, economist, a town planner. Um, and the aim in all of these cases is just to say, uh, if someone asks what political responsibilities they have, then either they have power or they can be part of something powerful. And when they can be part of something powerful, then they have a, a moral reason to do that. Um, and to use, utilize that collective resource to bring about a sustainable society. So in all cases, I think we need to think, well, what are the weak points? Who can make a difference? How can I contribute to that? Let me just add two further kind of uh, points about power and responsibility. Uh, one is I've looked at everything so far from the point of view of getting things done. So those with the power to affect change have responsibility and others have responsibilities to um, be part of organizations that can exercise power and support them. But any plausible account of responsibilities is gonna recognize that there are just limits. Um, and one of these I think is worth underscoring, which is it's epistemically pretty demanding to tell people um, be part of a political movement for sustainable change because it's quite hard to figure out what the obstacles are, uh, what the genuine friends of sustainability are, who are the false friends. So um, I think we should be sensitive to cases where someone says, I just don't know and I can't reasonably be expected to find out. However, that said, I just think a lot of people um, can't use that as an excuse. And then there's this claim five. So uh, the, the kind of next point I wanna make here is that if you think that with power comes responsibility, it's gonna be very clear that people's contributions are gonna be very different, that there's no kind of uniform thing that everyone should do uh, because their capabilities will be different uh, the nature of their capabilities and also the nature of the constraints they face in their life. Okay, so um, that in a way is the first really important substantive set of things I want to say. If you think about other issues to do with responsibility, sometimes you know we look at you know who contributed to the problem the most or um, who has the most wealth. Uh, my suggestion is those are not really central to this question about political power and change. My, my proposal, but maybe people will have objections, is that the guiding thought should be um, those that I've set out about power bringing with it responsibility, and powerlessness bringing with it also responsibility. Okay, here's a, a, kind, of a, a kind of a next uh, claim that I think would follow on neatly from what I've said. So, as I said at, at the start, I think it's important to be guided here by the best social scientific understandings that we have of attempts to bring about climate legislation. And, and one thing that comes across in um, all of the literature I've read is that coalitions are essential and where, for example, uh, groups have been able to put climate legislation on the books that are meaningful, that's only been possible because they've been able to uh, bring on others who may not agree with them on everything, but they agree with them on this. So this means that organizations um, have duties to form coalitions. Um, and then th I think this brings with it a set of further responsibilities. 
because as soon as you're working together with others, you have associational responsibilities to the others with whom you're working. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to uh, propose is that the members of political coalitions to create a sustainable world um, have a, re a responsibility to ensure that their coalition is inclusive and representative. Um, they have epistemic reasons for doing that. I mean, political coalitions that are made up of people just like me, so male, middle class, uh, uh, white, um, are going to be uh, likely to be insensitive to some of the distributive implications or uh, it would be much more robustly effective if we have um, people who are affected from all walks of life. And, and it's important to bear this in mind because many kind of climate policies have harmful and adverse effects if they're not done correctly. So uh, I think if people are engaged in political action, they need to um, make sure that it's as inclusive as possible for epistemic reasons. And I think there's a, an additional legitimacy based reason, uh, namely that if you're claiming to speak on behalf of others, then uh, you need to make sure that you're genuinely inclusive and in representing those others. So this is like a conditional uh, obligation if you're gonna take part in the political action to bring about a sustainable world, then immediately you incur additional responsibilities. And you know, bodies that don't do this uh, get criticized for it. Here's a further corollary. If you're a member of a political organization trying to create a sustainable world, you immediately confront what I think of as the, the fidelity compromise dilemma. Um, you, there might be better terms for it. Uh, it's, you, know, you could contrast it with you know, purity, ideological purity versus what works, or uh, you, know, you might call it the ethics of conviction, the ethics of responsibility to use uh, Weberian terms. The, the dilemma I have in mind is this, if you're a part of a, a movement to try and create a sustainable world um, and you are part of a coalition, uh, it's gonna be, um, infinitesimally unlikely that everyone is going to agree with you. There are going to be different points of view, different goals, different strategies. Um, and this puts people in a bind because on the one hand, there are good reasons to compromise. Uh, organizations will only be effective if there's unity. Uh, and you know, if you're working together with people who differ from you, that they might be smart, thoughtful, reasonable people. I think it could be inappropriate for me just to ride roughshod over their views and to impose my views. So there's good reasons uh, why people um, might want to compromise. And they'll say things like the best should not be the enemy of the good. On the other hand, um, compromise comes at costs. Uh, this is the kind of fidelity part of it. Uh, it's a moral cost into parting for one, what one thinks is actually best and right. There's a danger of things just being watered down and diluted, of being co-opted uh, and just agreeing to fairly minimal changes when much more radical change is required. And so the slogan of this side is the good enough should not act in ways that block the best. And th this uh, strikes me as a genuine dilemma because both horns have, you know, good reasons in support of them. There are reasonable concerns. It's of course an entirely, uh, it's not a new dilemma at all. Um, those on the left uh, have had this for at least a hundred years, if not more. If you think about the revisionist controversy in the German Social Democratic Party and the battle between uh, reformists and revolutionaries or internal debates within green parties. So the, the Rialos and the Fundies in the German Green Party of the 1980s. So, um, you know, how do we negotiate this? I don't, you know, think there's any um, clear and decisive uh, account of how to negotiate it, apart from the rather vague thought of, we should just do whatever you think is most likely to bring about the best good there or the most good there. And that, that will vary in the circumstances depending on 
how great the, the changes might be, what the probabilities of any more dramatic policies might be in succeeding. I do think there's some kind of useful ways of thinking about it. Um, and the uh, eco-socialist Andre Gortz had a, a kind of a useful framework that he proposed in the early 1960s between what he called revolutionary reforms and reformist reforms. And uh, reformist reforms are ones that um, you can agree with on people now, but they further re-entrench and reinforce the status quo. Uh, that's not what we should be after, he said. What we should be after is what he calls non-reformist reforms or revolutionary reforms. And those are reforms that improve the status quo, but they don't reinforce it. They don't block transitions to um, a better, more dramatic change. And we find a similar kind of distinction uh, in some of the literature on socio-technological transitions, where some canvas what they call uh, two-world technologies. And what they mean by this is a technological innovation that can be used in the here and now, um, but doesn't lock us in to the current system that enables and facilitates transition to another system, so another world. So the two world in the sense of uh, they um, uh, serve important valuable goals here and now, but they don't create lock-in. Okay, so if someone asks, well, how do we think about these issues of compromise? I think, well, let's be guided by that. If we're going to have to compromise, um, compromise on two world technologies. Don't um, compromise on ones that just lock us in and are an improvement, but uh, thwart any further attempts or further improvement. And then I want to kind of come to one final political responsibility. Uh, and this is about epistemic uh, humility and the importance of reflexivity. I think having looked at a lot of the literature on socio-technical transitions and the politics of, of carbon, a lot of it's uncertain. A lot of the understanding of what changes uh, are best are um, controversial and, and mired in dispute. And I think if people are engaged in political change to try and create a sustainable world, it would be irresponsible to do that um, if they don't properly research that the nature of the policies they're aiming for, the political liabilities that they may incur if they go wrong, um, and they you know, are willing to revise their, their policies and political strategies in the light of experience. That, that may seem um, trite and obvious, but I think it's not always honored. Okay, so, um, that kind of sums up what I've been trying to persuade you of. I, I've put it here as a list of claims. So let me just try and sort of summarize. Point one, which I really want to uh, drive home is, I think uh, if we're gonna have an account of political responsibilities, we need to do something like political backcasting. We need to think about what would be needed to change and then work back from that as to who should do what. Then I've tried to say, if that's how we do things and we want to think about who can do what, we need to figure out who has power uh, because with the, those who have power have the responsibility. And then I wanted to address someone who says, but, but what if I don't have power? And then my reply is that within limits, there are responsibilities to create power, to be part of something powerful, to bring about change. Um, and as I said, there are limits to that, that's uh, claim four. And there's a corollary of everything I've said so far, which is there will be no uniform account of politicals, people's political responsibilities. And then the next series of claims are really, if we're serious about creating a sustainable world, we need to form coalitions. And then that has three further implications, I think. There's the duty of inclusivity and representativeness. There's, um, confronting what I call the fidelity compromise dilemma. And there's the um, epistemic responsibility point that I made just a minute ago. 
So um, that uh, concludes my talk. I look forward to hearing any questions and objections. Simon, thank you very much. That was really interesting and engaging. Um, just a reminder to everyone, uh, please post any questions you have for Simon uh, on the YouTube live, live stream chat and we'll get through them as fast as we can. Um, so to kick it off, I've got a question for you here. Um, do you make any difference between duties and responsibilities? So you seem to sometimes use them interchangeably, but a possible stake of the distinction is the fact that duties are often thought as correlated to rights. So who would be the people holding the rights correlated to political duties? Um, thank you. Yeah, so I, I was using them interchangeably and some people do distinguish between them also maybe in different ways to that. Um, so yeah, Iris Marion Young, for example, in her account of political responsibilities, thinks that um, they don't have a specific designated precise content in the way that duties do. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I want to accept that kind of distinction. Um, and yeah, I think I don't, I would not use duties just to mean correlative to rights. So I think um, I, I have a duty, I don't know, to, uh, to say thank you to someone who gives me a birthday gift, but I, I don't think they have a right to that. So linguistically, I'm not sure I would um, uh, wanna say that the duties are always correlative to rights. But, um, but if someone does think that, then, um, they should just delete my references to duties and put in responsibilities because I, I don't necessarily want to tie everything to rights in this case. D does that help answer that? I think that's perfect, yeah. Um, and just so you know, I'm posting the questions as I ask them in the chat on the uh, okay. Zoom call. Uh, so the next question we've got, is uh, in reference to what you might call your Spider-Man principle. Yeah. Uh, so what about the classic alternatives Megan Blomfield has presented to us, for example, uh, such as the beneficiary pays principle, the polluter pays principle, and I'd add to that the uh, ability to pay principle. Do you think these principles don't apply when it comes to political responsibility? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't made up my mind on this finally, but my, yeah, I think my provisional view is that they don't apply to political responsibility. So the way I've um, thought about those principles is uh, if someone asks me, well, let's assume that cl um, climate policies uh, impose burdens on people, who should pay for those burdens? Uh, who should pay for the costs? Um, and those principles are often wheeled out as answers to that question. So if I have polluted or, or contributed to the harm in some way, then uh, I ought to pay if I, um, according to the Pluto pays, if uh, I'm wealthy, uh, maybe I should contribute to the pain because I have a greater ability to pay. So for me, the, the logical application of those seems to be on that burden sharing kind of question, and not about um, who should bring about political change. And you, you might even see there's a, a tension between appealing to these when it comes to political change. So uh, what I think is that those who have the power to affect change have a responsibility to do that. Um, what if someone says, no, I think um, those who've uh, polluted the most have a responsibility to, to do that. So therefore, BP and SO, they should be in charge of the political transformation. That seems to me implausible. So I don't have a clearly worked out uh, answer to that question. But yeah, my hunch is that the, the burden sharing question is governed by these other kinds of principles and the political responsibility, responsibility one um, is uh, 
is governed by, you know, do you have the power to affect change? I mean, one other thing just to add here is, I do think accounts of political responsibility have to start like from two ends and kind of borrowing a way of thinking about it from Henry Shue's book, Basic Rights. You know, you have to think what would get the job done and secondly, and what would be fair to the duty bearer? And you kind of have to balance those. And I think if you focus on what would get the job done, it's very hard not to think, um, if you're a town planner and, and you have the capacity to design a more sustainable uh, urban environment, because you have that power, you have a responsibility to do that. It's not because how much you emitted in the past. It's not because you've got a lot of money. It's because, it's not because you benefited from climate change, it's that you're the crucial point in the political system. You can you know, pull that lever and produce better outcomes. Um, so I don't know, hopefully that will motivate the reasoning I have for thinking that those other principles are not the germane ones when it comes to this. I'm not sure how far I'd want to push it because uh, you, know, you might think, for example, the ability to pay principle and the power responsibility principle are structurally quite similar. They're asking people to do things for good, which they can well afford to do. But, um, but yeah, that's my case for keeping them compartmentalized. I was just going to, to add on to that point. Um, it seems like you could try to recast the ability to pay principle rather in terms of wealth, um, more in terms of your political power and political leverage. But um, I'll move on to the next question and uh, not hog the <laughs> not hog the air with my own. Um, so you talk about the responsibilities of those with legal expertise, but the law is somewhat missing from the overall account. Do you think there are responsibilities to push for legal change as well as political change? Yeah. Um, yeah, the short answer is yes. Uh, I was conscious that when I was giving examples that they're quite, you know, they're partial. And so a fuller account would have talked about all the things that people with uh, legal expertise can do. And one thing I perhaps you know, really ought to have mentioned is um, legal campaigns that have been used in many countries. Um, uh, I'm thinking of the agenda case uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so uh, activist groups using the law to try and uh, hold political actors accountable. So I think um, lawyers can certainly contribute in that way. Uh, what I had in mind was, and maybe I should just give some more context, so that there's a, um, there's a great book by um, Timmons Roberts and a co-author whose name I can't suddenly remember, on the, the political character of international negotiations to do with climate change. And at the beginning, um, they, uh, they say that the EU bring, brought along, I think it was 140 advisors on to, to advise them on the legal framework of the text to be discussed at the COP meeting. Whereas, uh, you know, small island states have to pull resources together to get one um, legal advisor, and they're just kind of outflanked. And so my thought there is, well, those who have the relevant legal expertise can play a valuable role there in um, in assisting and advising uh, representatives of, let's say, the Maldives or uh, Aoasis, and I know I know that occurs. There'll be many other cases where I think lawyers can contribute. So one thing I think we need is a is a clean energy revolution to incentivize more clean energy, and therefore lawyers with expertise on energy law and the intellectual property uh, rights uh, have a valuable role there in in trying to think of ways of designing. Uh, innovation law that will incentivize the, the creation and transfer of clean technologies. So yeah, lawyers can contribute in, in very many ways and I, I'm conscious I'll have left many others out that I could have mentioned. In a way it illustrates my point, which is you might think, well, what skills do I have? Then what difference can I make? Or even if I don't have those skills, 
who could I donate money to or who could I assist in other ways so that they can do that kind of work. But yeah, no, that's a good point. I should have said more about that. So the next question, um, this strikes me as a very forward looking and ideal theory account of political responsibility. Do you think the account ought to be sensitive to historical failures of responsibility? In other words, if people reasonably uh, knew they had responsibilities but failed to discharge them, do they have greater responsibilities in the future? Okay, good. So. Yeah, it is, it is explicitly a very forward looking way of doing it. Um, so I read a paper in 2014 called something like Two Kinds of Climate Justice. And I distinguished there between two uh, approaches. So one is harm prevention uh, and the other was um, burden sharing. And um, so the harm, prevention point of view says there's a crisis uh, it's got to stop who can do something about it and the burden sharing perspective says uh, um, well whatever action is taken it involves a burden that should be shared equitably and I think both perspectives matter a lot of the work I've done has been on the uh, the equitable distribution or the just distribution side which is the kind of intuition I think is being articulated here about what are those who've created the problem. Um, but I think we have reason to prioritize the harm prevention side. And uh, yeah, the, the reasoning there is, I mean, just think of any other emergencies. If I heard screaming outside my house at the moment, um, I wouldn't think, oh, look, the last, uh, time that it was screaming, I did it, and the time before I did it, it's someone else's job to do that. I think, no, I should go and look and see if I can help or do something about it. So there we kind of privilege, privilege harm prevention. And I, I think the climate crisis is a paradigm case of, um, of harm prevention. And so that explains why I'm, I'm adopting this kind of forward-looking approach. I don't think we should discuss equitable burden sharing. If I'm hearing the screaming, screaming outside, I should go and do something about it. So that's one reason then why I think um, historic failures of responsibility uh, are not uppermost in my account. I, I might think it would be meet and fitting if they took a lead, but even then I suppose uh, I'd like to know why that consideration, which, you know, is a Kind of very powerful one I share is relevant for political responsibility rather than burden sharing. So I might think um, if you think there's a group of people who have systematically harmed others, then they should pay compensation. So the historical failures should be included, responded to in that way. They have a responsibility to make amends. But um, maybe. All of us though, and especially the more powerful, those who are able to affect the political change have a duty to bring about the necessary political change. So it's like the wrongdoers should pay the burden, but the rest of us um, have a responsibility to try and create a just political framework. But yeah, th these are good questions. So I, I need to think more about my assumption of partitioning the political responsibilities from the other kinds of burden sharing. So to add on to that point, uh, the person who asked the question added, uh, relatedly, one of the problems of the Paris Agreement was that it was structurally flawed. So Trump could exit the agreement without threat of sanction. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, I mean, my, my, I suppose my understanding of the, the problems of the international negotiations I think have been shaped by something that Scott Barrett uh, wrote, which is there are two goals that you want and they pull in opposite directions. So one is you want universal and widespread membership and you also want it to have bite. But if it has bite, then you won't get the universal membership because people won't join up. Um, 
so the price of getting wider membership might be uh, to have fairly toothless ones. So yeah, I, I mean, the Paris Agreement is not um, by any terms an ideal agreement. Uh, and I don't want to be seen as endorsing it. Uh, my, my comment on the Paris one was there are, there are elements in it that can be utilized and are, to my knowledge are being utilized by NGOs um, to, uh, to pressurize governments into performing better. So, you know, creating league tables of which countries do better or worse at meeting their emissions targets or their investment in clean technology those um, kinds of things I think are, are the sort of tools that one could use given that. So yeah, the, the Paris Agreement is, is deeply flawed. It doesn't allocate responsibilities and it is, it is fairly toothless, but there are things we can use. And, and one thing I think is kind of interesting just from an intellectual point of view is that, uh, that to Thomas Schelling, the Nobel laureate in economics, when he um, was writing about climate change in the early nineties, actually proposed something like this. He said that the best compromise you're going to get is a system of, of constant periodic uh, reviews of how well countries do because they simply won't agree to anything more binding than that. So if he was right, then that's the most politically feasible um, option there is around at the moment. To my mind, this means that a lot of the emphasis should be elsewhere on uh, cities and on states and uh, other forms of political uh, association. So this was a reaction to one of the questions that you answered earlier um, in, in relation to the burden sharing principles. So maybe this is where the distinction between duties and responsibilities become important. Of course, it may seem absurd to say that BP has a responsibility to trigger political change and should be in charge to change things, but it doesn't seem absurd to say that they have a duty to do so. Um, not just to pay, sorry, not just to pay the costs, but actually to be part of the political change that brings it about. Um, yeah, I mean, that brings to mind, there was a distinction I was thinking of using, which wasn't to do with duties and responsibilities. It's just to do with responsibilities, but it does kind of perhaps capture that point as well. So I think there's a difference between saying X has a responsibility to do Y and saying um, X should be allocated the responsibility of doing Y. So here's, here's a reason, here's an example of which would illustrate it and unfortunately I can only think of a trivial example but suppose you have an academic department and, and there's a colleague who has been there many years and has shirked administrative responsibilities and it's really his or her turn to do be exams officer or whatever so you might think um, they have a responsibility to be exams officer and to do a good job of it and you might think that's entirely right because uh, you know, it's just their turn, everyone else has done it. So you might think that and then you, but you might also quite consistently think, I don't think they ought to be allocated the responsibility of doing that because if they were put in charge, they would be negligent and it'd be a disaster. So there is that distinction in between having a responsibility and being given the responsibility. Um, and yeah, maybe I wasn't being sufficiently clear about those. I mean, I guess what I want to, ask is, this is where <laughs> Zoom has its limits, um, is what would be the argument for saying that political responsibilities should be allocated in part by things like whether you have been a high polluter or not, or whether you've benefited more from pollution in the past or not. Um, I'd be interested to know if there's a positive argument for ascribing political responsibilities like that. Um, I think that, yeah, that would be quite an, un an unusual view more generally. So if I think about, right, say political responsibilities within the UK on, on other issues, you might think everyone has a duty as a citizen, but those who have um, uh, you know, more capacity to bring about 
uh, change or to preserve what's valuable in the status quo are more blameworthy if they don't use that for good, if they just sit idly by. So I think um, we expect more of those who have more power. We demand more when it comes to serving the cause of justice. But yeah, I, I need to think more about this and uh, I think I'm maybe just repeating myself. <laughs> Not at all. So moving on to the next one. Uh, the question is, I'm an advocate for collaboration, creating shared value, entrepreneurship and conversation. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the opportunities and new paradigm, more carrots and less sticks. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, let's think about, I'm just trying to think this through from first principles. Let's think about the obstacles to climate action and the opportunities available, because the way I think about the opportunities available, um, there's lots of carrots there. So that the pitch would be um, many people would benefit from a transition to a clean economy. Uh, people would benefit obviously because they're not suffering from dangerous climate change, but they would benefit because of um, uh, cleaner air, there'd be health benefits from more physical exercise, more cycling and so on. And there's potential benefits in, in, um, in green jobs. So there's a coalition of actors out there who would all be beneficiaries. And I think any successful movement will have to uh, draw attention. Well, it doesn't have to, but I think it's very likely that it'll have to draw attention to all of those benefits. And then I think um, if we're thinking about entrepreneurship, uh, you know, then I think the, the pitch would be something like um, uh, people, we should try and design the, the political and economic framework so that people's economic incentives don't push in an unsustainable way so that people can, you know, make money from clean technology. Uh, that they can um, invest, but invest in in clean enterprise. So um, I didn't. I don't really see it as sort of uh, sticks so much. Well, partly sticks and partly carrots. And I guess the political challenge is to try and find a coalition where it's in people's material interests to bring about that sort of change. So I don't know if that says enough to uh, bring out the um, opportunity-centered nature of a political transition, because. Because clearly, um, that that side is important. Great. So, do you think that some of the terminal terminological binaries, which have relatively recently entered student debate on these topics, such as global north versus global south, or climate justice for women before men? a constructive or counterproductive or alienating? If so, what language would you think would be more appropriate? Yeah, I, um, I'm not familiar with people campaigning of, for climate justice for women before men. Um, but the first example on global north versus global, global south. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to think these ways of putting it are Kind of a bit too, too blunt. So when it comes to ascribing, um, so distributive responsibilities about who should pay, I generally think we should have as fine grained an account as possible. That is, we should look at individuals as much as is possible. And so phrases like the global north and global south are unhelpful then because they obscure the inequalities within those categories. Um, so. Uh, it's important to bear in mind that the global north contains many people facing fuel poverty and the global south contains many people who are um, pretty affluent and high emitters. So, so yeah, I kind of agree with, with that kind of thrust of not using um, you know, unduly uh, blunt terminological categories. Uh, I think the language one is going to be 
an issue or it's going to be a difficult one because in a way it goes to the point I made about coalitions which is people will frame this issue in very different ways so economists will frame this as a, a problem of a, a market externality uh, lots of activists and some political philosophers will say this is a case of climate injustice or well, Anil Agarwal and Sunrita Narain sort of linked it to colonialism and um, people will have their preferred ways of, of seeing it. I certainly have my preferred way of seeing it. I do think it's a form of global injustice. Um, but this is the case then when, when you have coalitions, you're gonna to have to have people who are working towards the same goals, who frame it quite differently. And then I think there's a, a duty or responsibility not to let those kinds of different framings get in the way of doing the right thing. So if a, an entrepreneur wants to invest in clean technology, partly just because they think it's a good business opportunity, I don't think it matters whether they buy into the way I conceptualize it. It, it just matters we can find points of agreement. So on the, on the larger terms of the, the language being used, um, I think insisting on one's preferred way of doing it is, is going to court um, problems that are unnecessary. It's not, I should just add to this, it's not just language. So uh, I've argued for quite many years that climate change violates human rights. Some people really don't find that a helpful way of thinking about it. So I kind of think, well, in those cases, um, I don't really want to uh, have to frame it in terms of, of rights if it alienates people who don't share that perspective as long as it doesn't come with any kind of unacceptable moral um, loss or cost, because um, I think if people are dismissive of rights there, they have a tendency to endorse climate policies that also violate human rights. But, but the point is just, um, I don't think people should insist on their vocabulary if it stands in the way of effective political action. So in light of this account, uh, do you think academics should do more interdisciplinary collaboration and more public engagement work? Um, thank you. Well, I'm gonna, I can say a very short answer to this, which is yes, <laughs> but maybe I should say a little bit more. Um, mm. I think, yeah, so here's some reasons why. So uh, yeah, here, here are three reasons that weigh heavily with me. So on the interdisciplinary, I think academics really need to do this because the problems are so hard and they involve so many different disciplines that um, it's really hard to do a good job um, from within your own discipline and just uh, winging it on other disciplines. I think that's unacceptable um, because you're just much more likely to make mistakes. Um, uh, so um, yeah, that's one main point. And maybe I can just flesh that into two different variants. So one is, I think it's really important to have properly formed questions. And so as someone whose background is in political philosophy, I think it's very easy for political philosophers and moral philosophers to ask the wrong question without understanding the empirics um, or not to be aware of some of the right questions um, to ask. And that only comes with um, engagement with people who have knowledge in uh, other disciplines. So, so one example of this was I um, came across someone who, uh, who asked me, um, you know, what did I think about feed-in tariffs as used in the UK? And um, the system of feed-in tariffs was such that they did reduce emissions, but they were funded by the general um, consumer of uh, um, energy companies. And so the point they were getting at is these tend to be very regressive because middle class people can afford to install something, but the general consumer, which will include many non middle class people will be paying for it. And that's the kind of uh, question which I wouldn't have uh, thought about because I just was unaware of the political of the, the kind of the empirical challenge being thrown. Um, so yeah, the plate of philosophers is engaged with the, those from the natural sciences and the social sciences and the plate of the others is 
I think philosophers have some uh, useful insights on, on the concepts and arguments being made. I'll just say one other thing on the public engagement side is I just think um, people live in their own bubbles and you're more likely to develop well-founded views if you encounter people from very different disciplines and backgrounds um, who may ask questions that uh, you know I just hadn't thought about before. So I think um, uh, people like myself benefit from that. And then hopefully, this will be the third one, hopefully it's uh, a valuable service to the wider society that um, the hope is that, yeah, moral and political philosophers have something useful to say on these challenges. So I have a, a question on that point. Um, I, it, it would be great to know if you've encountered any barriers um, approaching this topic from a philosophical angle. And also to that, uh, how might you encourage undergraduates and graduates to work on this topic, given that there are some limitations to interdisciplinary collaboration at those levels? Uh, and in addition to that, certain disciplinary restrictions, um, the idea that some people might say, oh, work on climate change is perhaps not philosophical enough to fit within the original discipline. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, there are barriers. I suppose there are um, probably academic barriers in the sense of um, purely theoretical work tends to be valorized more than applied work. Um, but, you know, I think these are negotiable and, and often, um, you know, some very distinguished people have done and are doing both. But that is a, a barrier. I suppose there are incentive type uh, issues about whether people are incentivized or not to do um, purely disciplinary work. I suspect that's changing and has changed quite a lot. But, um, but I certainly think at certain points um, there were strong institutional disincentives for doing uh, applied work or interdisciplinary work. Um, what advice would I give? Well, actually, yeah, I'm not sure this is advice so much as a wish. Um, I, I do think there should be more forms for collective work on issues like this, uh, because I think it's extremely hard for anyone from any one discipline to, um, to work on it. So this is not so much advice to undergraduates thinking to work on it, um, so much as to those with uh, control over um, grants and academic uh, resources to facilitate uh, contexts where people can work together as parts of teams, because I think uh, those, those have their own difficulties because, um, yeah, people in teams may quite strongly disagree, or if you've, re if you've read things that some teams have written, then it doesn't read as a as a kind of a clearly well thought out document so much as a hodgepodge of what separate people have written. But nonetheless, I kind of think it, the starting point is it's really hard to write about some things if your expertise is in just one discipline and there are risks to someone trying to get command over lots of other disciplines. And so the optimal solution is to find ways that people can uh, work together. Um, and I suppose to undergraduates or anyone else interested in it, I would think, well, find uh, universities where people collaborate and work together and are willing to talk to people outside their discipline, because that's, that's a good way of learning what the right questions are and the relevant kinds of literature. So could you please say a bit more on the distinction you quoted between revolutionary reform and reformist reform? Uh, some examples would be great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll try. So I should say it's a little bit vague in Gortz, but yeah, the, the key distinction is supposed to be this, that a, a, um, a reformist reform improves the status quo, but it blocks attempts to 
make any further changes. And uh, a revolutionary reform is a reform that also improves the status quo, but doesn't block any further changes. So here are two examples, neither of which I'm necessarily endorsing, but I think they would illustrate it. So example number one, um, as I said, there was this heated debate in the early 20th century and it persists right till, till now within uh, left-wing parties about uh, whether they should go for a reform or revolution. And I think those who favored revolution like Rosa Luxemburg would argue this, they would say uh, the, the proposals being put forward by people like Edward Bernstein to ameliorate capitalism uh, will leave people sufficiently content that they won't campaign for any further change. So if we started at T1, they would take us to T2 and T2 would be better than T1, but it um, would uh, undermine any further attempts to go to T3 or T4. Now, it's really you know, lots contestable there, but that's a kind of illustration of how some people would think that something could be a reform, but it would uh, not be optimal in the long run because it would um, block further developments. So uh, he, he, let me try and think of a more energy relevant one. Um, someone um, might think that we're facing this climate crisis and what we should move towards is a system of nuclear energy. And they might think that's an improvement on the status quo, but then they might think that if we move to a system of nuclear energy, that would just crowd out any possible other developments like more use of renewables, which they think would be better. So then um, using this distinction, they would say nuclear energy is a reform, but it's a reformist reform. It, it improves things, let's say, for the sake of argument, but it, it blocks further progress. So that, that's supposed to be uh, um, the way that dis the distinction operates. Uh, I mean, I'll try and think, not now, but I'll try and think of other better examples to illustrate it. In some ways, I think the, 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 the distinction I made after that between one world and two world technologies may be more intuitive to some people. And a two world technology is one that you could uh, use here and now but its um, utility wouldn't cease in the future if you change to a completely um, different system. Uh, I don't know, so that's my best attempt for, to try and uh, distinguish between reformist reforms and, and revolutionary reforms. Great, so the next question. Um... How can political responsibility for climate action learn from and support current racial justice movements and protests, especially given the overlap of racial and environmental justice? So for example, how, if at all, might those movements inform strategies for affecting political change or understandings of power? Yeah, good. I mean, I think there are lots of uh, ways of mutual learning. Um, I'm not sure I, on the top of all that I would want to say on the subject. I mean, I haven't thought through all the possible links. So, so one thing to, to say is, I think um, it kind of underscores, yeah, and it was partly in my mind when I talked about duties of political movements for being inclusive and representative. So some organizations, I mean, like uh, Extinction uh, Rebellion, uh, you know, for all the good they do, uh, have been criticised for being insufficiently uh, inclusive and containing, you know, uh, mainly uh, white people, white middle class people, and being insufficiently uh, representative. And I think that is a, sort of a, a downside of uh, Extinction Rebellion to the extent that's true. So I think one thing um, that is very important to, to kind of draw from this is the importance of uh, a wide variety of inclusive support. Second thing one might draw from this is that what looks like it can't be changed um, can be changed. Uh, so uh, I remember when the Roads Must Fall campaign began, I think it was 2015, 
and a huge amount of a program was directed at some of the students who began that. Um, but we've seen because of that and because of recent movements uh, in the US and in the UK now to do with statues that what seems permanent and unchangeable can change. So that's another important lesson. I guess the third thing just to say is I've, I've argued in some of my sort of more philosophical work for what I call integrationism. And it, what integrationism says is we shouldn't kind of carve out climate and treat it on its own in, in isolation from lots of other things. And I think this is one important, um, you know, so the question also brings out the importance of having an integrated uh, viewpoint because I mean, the harmful effects of climate change are disproportionately borne both globally and nationally by uh, racial minorities. So there's all kinds of interconnections. Um, I'm still kind of thinking through ways of mutual support or mutual learning, but um, that's my provisional thoughts at the moment. So the next question is um, a big one. It's so big that um, it didn't all fit in the Zoom chat. <laughs> so bear with me um, and I'll see if I can try and get through it. So a possible rationale to say that a special political responsibility falls on big polluters would be the following. Many people do think they have a high responsibility when it comes to pay for the transition. To have polluted it in the past would give some kind of economical responsibility. As Megan Blomfield and I would add Henry Hsu have put it, the intuitive reason behind it seems to be that you need to clean up your own mess. But surely paying is not the only way to clean up your own mess. Campaigning for ecologists, for example, is surely another relevant means. Therefore, if you buy the idea that big polluters have a big economic responsibility, you do seem to have uh, a reason to think that they have a political responsibility. Of course, this rationale could be outweighed by pragmatic reasons, but at least as a prima facie, uh, it seems to be a relevant reason that they have a political responsibility. Unless, of course, you think there's a big difference between economic responsibility and political responsibility that would account for the fact that one can be acquired through past pollution and the other can't. Yeah, okay, good. So, um... Yeah, I guess the, the nub of the issue is uh, whether if you think that big polluters have an economic responsibility, which I do, uh, then it therefore follows that they have a political responsibility, which is what I'm not sure of. So, I mean, as a general logical point, uh, there are lots of cases where someone might have one kind of responsibility for a reason, but it doesn't follow that they have another kind of responsibility. So uh, I guess the question is then, um, why would the one necessarily entail the other? Why would having a big economic responsibility mean they have uh, a political responsibility? So suppose um, some, uh, corporations commit some economic wrong, right? They're fraudulent in some way. Then we would think um, they should pay, let's say, certain fines. Uh, do we therefore then say that they have a political responsibility, I don't know, uh, to advise um, politicians and lawyers um, in the future, I don't, I don't really see that. So I think uh, wrongdoers can incur certain kinds of responsibility here that is discharged by, let's say, paying compensation or paying a fine or um, paying a debt and so on. But there's a further logical step, which I don't quite see as to why that therefore translates into a political responsibility. Um, now, I'm not saying there couldn't be, it's just I can't, uh, I guess, I can't quite see the inference. I suppose the other thing I just want to add is the other reason isn't just pragmatic, it's a moral responsibility to prevent harm. 
So it's not ideally or morally the high polluter should change the, the political system. Um, it's that um, others with the capability to do good have a moral reason to do that and to put that in some cases over and above um, other considerations. So it's not just pr pragmatic. Yeah, so I guess what, I mean, the thing I, I'm, I suppose, I need to give an argument as to why the two are distinct and someone else needs to give an argument as to why they're all interconnected. And so we could say, yeah, the, the US has a political responsibility to, well, no, the US isn't a good example because it has immense political power, but those who have high emissions um, have a responsibility in virtue of that to uh, change the political system for the better. Um, yeah, so uh, that's that's the kind of the nub of the issue. That what's that's what needs resolving. I mean, suppose there was such an argument that said, "Yeah, these other things are relevant." Then, um, then I suppose what I'd be offering is a hybrid view that says that there are responsibilities in virtue of power, and there are responsibilities in virtue of other things, like having um, contributed to the problem. Uh, I mean, I should add, yeah, maybe I should add. I mean, I'm in favor of a hybrid view in another sense, which is although I've emphasized with power comes responsibility, I don't think it's the only source of political responsibility, but I didn't um, want to take up too much time. But another one might just be, as a member of a state, a body that claims to act in my name, um, I might have a responsibility for what my state does. Um, and that's a basis of having a responsibility that doesn't vary, well, it's not necessarily because of power, it's, it's purely on the basis that uh, qua member I, I acquire certain responsibilities. Even then, I think that would require a certain degree of political efficacy to be meaningful, but it wouldn't claim that responsibilities increase the more power I have. So we're nearing the end of the questions that have come up on the live stream. Um, if anyone has any more, I do encourage you to post them. It, the lack of questions, maybe someone has written um, that they find your talk very plausible and have no questions. So <laughs> I think every, everyone is agreeing with you. Um, if I might ask one myself, um, how closely linked is your account to utilitarianism and the demands of affluence? So you talk about with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a responsibility politically to do what we can, but where do we draw the limits of that? And another way of putting that is how much is demanded of us? Yeah, good. So um, I first presented an argument a bit like this, uh, Ingmar Persson um, said, you sound like Peter Singer in Famine, Affluence and Morality. And so for the, the philosophers who are listening, uh, you know, one version of his argument in there is that if you can prevent something bad from happening, then you have, and then there's some variations, a, um, a duty to do so, or if you can do it at reasonable cost, or, uh, and he has a stronger version. And in one sense, yeah, I'm agreeing with his more moderate version there, which is if you have the power to prevent something bad from happening at reasonable cost, you have uh, a duty to do that. But, you know, that, that, as he emphasizes there, is not committed to utilitarianism. I think that's a fairly uh, widespread kind of intuition that very many people would share from many different moral um, theories. So um, it is forward-looking um but it's not tied to utility or to maximization but then yeah someone could ask well what are the what are the reasonable limits and and i, I gestured it too but maybe i should amplify those a bit so um so one thought is there should be kind of an absolute level you know limits on how much i can be demanded 
And then the second thought might be there should be comparative kind of component, which is it's unfair to ask more of me than it is of other people. Um, it's, you know, philosophers have found it, I think, very hard to kind of specify exactly what would constitute unreasonably um, demanding. But I can kind of think of cases here where, and this may be a more controversial implication, but where, so some people may disagree with this, where we might say actually someone has almost no political responsibilities. So um, there's quite an influential book on US politics by Gillens and Page, which um, uh, chronicles how um, you know, most political decisions in the country correspond with the, the wishes of the, um, the richest uh, grouping, I can't remember what percent they use. Um, and you know, the others translate into policy if they coincide with this, but otherwise they're not. So imagine someone reading um, or being aware of this and think I, I'm politically uh, inefficacious. I, um, I just, I have no political power really. And uh, if you ask me to join a body, well, they don't have any power either because it's just dominated by corporate interests. So I have very little leverage and I'm also holding down three jobs. And then you say, well, campaign in the interests of a sustainable world. Well, I just don't know because I hear these experts on TV and they all say different things. So I remember when the Brexit campaign was going on, someone from uh, my local town was on TV saying exactly this. She said she just had no idea what was best because she felt uh, unable to judge what would work. And so then I think there are, you could say, well, you should try and do research and find out. But, but part of me just thinks that could be epistemically unreasonably demanding. So then there may be cases where someone says, um, I have no political agency or very little. I um, don't know what the right direction um, we should be heading in is, because people come up with all proposals for sustainable climate. I can't really judge which are the genuine ones and which aren't. And I've got lots of other demands on my time. Then I kind of think that would be a reasonable set of considerations where they could say this is just too demanding but you know to many of us I think those considerations just don't apply and so we can't be let off the hook so there isn't a very there's not at all a precise answer to the question about um, demandingness but uh, what I'm trying to say is I suppose there just might be some clear-cut cases of ones where something is unreasonably demanding and and others we can say let's say of um, yeah, members of a, of a profession which has a union, what is your union doing about this? Uh, where is your pension fund uh, invested? Those I don't think are unreasonable demands to make on people. Great, so we've got a comment here on uh, interdisciplinary working, which I'll just read. Uh, the last time I heard a sociologist speak on climate change, uh, Elizabeth Shove claimed that sociologists get lost in the discussion, a, a problem where social change is the nub. Yeah. Do you have any response to that? Um, yes, so I did actually mention her research and, and, and drew on it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I don't think the sociologists get lost in the academic discussion. Um, I think knowing some things that she's written, she thinks that uh, politicians don't um, sufficiently appreciate the insights of sociologists. And so for she's, uh, she's written in criticism of a certain kind of method um, that she thinks politicians often use, which um, is uh, it treats individuals as having agency and it gives them incentives and nudges and it expects them to do the work. And the point of her work on practices, as I understand it, um, is uh, this is just really ill-equipped to bring about a clean energy um, transformation because individuals are in, uh, sort of, they're often located within social practices and norms which are incredibly 
powerful, you're stigmatized if you don't comply with it. And so, you know, government policy is predicated on a, a false methodology. So I think that's what she was saying. I think um, uh, that what she says there is right. Um, and I suspect she is also right that they get excluded from government framings. So I think academic discussions of it, such as what I'm trying to do, um, you know, can do, and hopefully mine did do better on that front. Um, hers was the example of uh, the culture of wearing business suits is uh, a driver of unsustainability and it's unquestioned. Well, actually it got changed. So the positive element in her story was the government um, tried to you know, change the norm and people did change the norm. So there was less pressure. Um, and I kind of think her work illustrates the value of interdisciplinary work because I also think many moral and political philosophers working on climate often assume a rather individualistic picture where individuals have the agency to reduce their emissions. And, and I think people can do way more than they often do do and, and think they can do, but there are very real constraints and her work to my mind nicely brings that out. So I don't think she should be excluded from the conversation. All right, so for the now all time the question in regards to COVID-19. So what have we learned about political responsibility from the action of governments with respect to COVID, uh, excluding here the US and the UK? Uh, does this experience change our political responsibilities? Um, or another way of putting it, do the actions of individual individuals or governments give you hope for your account? Mm. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, so the main thing I think we learn from this that's relevant for this is that uh, lack of preparedness and inability to think about the long term is immensely costly and that governments like the New Zealand one, for example, um, performed way much, uh, way better because they were better equipped to make uh, decisive in early interventions. Um, and so uh, I think short-termism, um, which Alice mentioned that I worked on, uh, is, a, is a deep problem and it probably was manifest here. I think the other thing that I think of when it comes to the responsibilities of individuals is um, that um, epistemic humility is incredibly important here. And there have been some quite prominent academics, I'm thinking of ones in the US, who don't have expertise in the area, who've confidently pronounced on the optimal policies and got things badly wrong. And so I suppose another lesson is don't wing it, don't talk outside your expertise, uh, don't assume that there is a uniform group called the experts who all agree, but do listen to experts, including diverging experts. So um, uh, those are two lessons I would learn from that, the importance of early um, uh, action and preparedness and epistemic humility. So I've got a question regarding uh, short term and short termism. Um, when and why do you think short termism became the prominent prominent way of thinking and planning when it comes to governments? Um, or is it the case that short termism has always been uh, the main way of thinking? Um, yeah, well, I think, yeah, it, it has been a problem for a long, long time. So, uh, I mean, for example, just to illustrate, um, uh, thinkers like Hobbes uh, and uh, Locke wrote about um, human beings tendency to focus on the short term rather than the long term. Uh, Hume wrote about it. I mean, Hume thought that this is why we need institutions because otherwise individuals will act irrationally in their short term interests rather than comply with principles of justice that are realized that realize their interest in the long term. 
So I don't think it's a new problem. And there are lots of kind of influential works on democratic theory that uh, from a variety of different um, ideological viewpoints that um, uh, worry about short-termism. So uh, Joseph Schumpeter, for example, uh, wrote about it in Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy from um, a sort of a classical liberal viewpoint. Hayek worried about it because he thought governments gave into short-term preferences and that was inflationary. So point number one is I think it's been a problem for a long time. But point number two is that uh, we have, you know, we have powers now that can um, exert their influence on the world for hundreds and if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And so it's politically salient now that yeah, say nuclear waste can last for hundreds of thousands of years or that CO2 emissions will last in the atmosphere for um, hundreds if not thousands of years as well. So, um, you know, to my mind, there's a really deep problem because democracies tend to, or all political systems tend to focus on the short term um, and have short temporal horizons, but the problems we're facing have temporal horizons that stretch uh, way beyond that. So there's a kind of a mismatch between probably human psychology, between political institutions and their incentives um, and the powers we have and the powers uh, go far beyond the short term. So I think climate change is, is one illustration of this, this kind of uh, problem. And, you know, the Anthropocene more generally is an illustration of it. But, but you also find it with many other problems that um, are not to do with the environment at all, like, um, you know, dealing with aging societies or dealing with um, the pensions crisis. Uh, these are similar ones where governments have delayed taking action and have kind of kicked the problem down the road. Um, because uh, you know it's it's um, a difficult problem and it'll probably be electorally disadvantageous to deal with it. So uh, so I think they're kind of deep rooted problems why most political systems are quite short term and um, they're, they're quite harmful uh, for both those currently living now. But they also mean we don't honour responsibilities to future future generations. So, I mean, I think there are things we can do about it, but I think um, it's a really deep problem with the way that many societies operate at the moment, that they're, they're not equipped to take the long run decisions. And this is, um, yeah, this is very harmful. Okay. So we're nearing the top of the hour. So we're only gonna have a time for a few more questions, which have started to roll in again. Um, the next one, so what would you say uh, the political responsibilities of subnational actors are, for example, C40 Cities Initiatives and other NGOs, and their role in addressing climate change or change point blank? So um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know about the C40 Cities Initiatives, um, so which I obviously should do, so I'll have to look. Um, I have to look that up. I do. I do think cities have a, um, a tremendously valuable role to play, uh, partly because they 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 have sufficient political power to do things often, um, and sometimes they're ahead. I'm thinking here of the U.S. They're ahead of the the federal government in in doing things. So both cities in the U.S. and also states in the U.S. are often more ambitious in their targets than. Um, the federal government. And I think there are several, you know, valuable features of it. I mean, one is, it seems much more doable to try and create a sustainable city. It seems the scale is sufficiently small that it, uh, it, it seems, you know, much more politically feasible to do that. Um, the second thing is, it's a form of social learning. So people, you know, cities can learn from what other cities have have done to reduce emissions. They can try out uh, things like the charge, which uh, you know London used or Durham City, um, with other schemes, and people can compare and see which ones have worked. And I think it's valuable for uh, the second kind of strategy I mentioned, which was interstitial st strategies. These are, are cases where there are pockets of sustainability within a broadly unsustainable society. They can give people hope and inspiration that um, 
it is possible to have effective climate politics. So for all these reasons, I think um, you know, the focus on sustainable cities and the role of cities is very important. So just the last question here, um, in relation to what you said about uh, COVID-19, it might be that exogenous shocks are more of a motivator than campaigns to prevent harm before the shock arises. So only climate change itself uh, can precipitate actions. It would be great to hear your thoughts on that. Right, so let me just read that again. Um... Yeah, I mean, okay, so yeah, that one, one obviously big question is what will motivate people to change? And um, so, yeah, the suggestion is only climate change itself can precipitate action. Um, yeah, I hope that's not the case because by then it'll, well, it, to some extent it will, I mean, so we are living through climate change, but I take it the thought might be, if, if only if we have some kind of dramatic climatic changes, will that be enough to motivate people to act? And um, yeah, so the worries about this, I mean, this might be true, it is, this might be true, but one worry is if, if that's what it takes, it will be too late. Um, it will be too late and it also might push people in one direction rather than another. Um, so it might push people to focus more on adaptation than on mitigation. And that will tend to mean that those with the greatest affluence can protect themselves and those um, who are already marginalized and vulnerable are least equipped to cope. So none of this is evidence to, which would kind of dispute the empirical claim um, being mentioned, but there are reasons to worry that if that's true. Uh, then the effects will be bad. So then I think we have to think more positively. Uh, are there other ways of motivating change? And um, then I think we're back to the politics of coalition. So you might think, um, what are the motives we can appeal to? We can appeal to moral motives not to inflict harm. We can appeal um, to... Uh, prudential motives to um, not suffer from things like poor health because of air quality. We can offer reassuring motives to people who worry that um, it's going to be costly by pointing out um, that the subsidy of the, um, of the fossil fuel industry is immensely costly. So uh, we could actually um, you know, reduce taxes or just eliminate the subsidies and divert the funds elsewhere. Uh, we could reassure people worried about jobs that, that um, the focus would have to be on a sustainable transition that produces green jobs. So what I'm trying to do is to say there's, there's reasons to think you could bring a, a coalition into existence that appeals to a variety of different constituencies um, for different reasons and some reasons may be more uppermost to others than others. Um, and then, you know, we could broaden that out because I mentioned, you know, you can mention investors and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the case to them is uh, the loss to their investments in stranded assets and the gains to their investments if they invest in, in clean technologies. You could also add, I mean, historically, others have tried to add other reasons, like, so sometimes people have presented climate change as an issue to do with security. And I remember some, uh, some generals from the Pentagon saying that climate change was a, uh, a threat multiplier, multiplier. That is, it would lead to more um, armed conflicts and this would lead to more demands on um, military forces. And so there was a sort of another reason for combating climate change that it would, it would uh, reduce these kinds of threats. Um, I think, you know, in some of these cases, you know, might be sceptical that there will be a genuine coalition or it'll always coalesce around the right things. Uh, some of the reasons people give might have untoward implications that uh, 
don't think should be accepted. So, so I'll just mention a security one. So sometimes people have said, well, we can have biofuels, for example, because that means we're less dependent on overseas oil. And I think when the US had a push towards biofuels, it was under the heading of energy. Um, but of course, biofuels themselves have harmful effects on, on other countries, arguably leading to a spike in, in food prices. So although I'm saying we can, we can build coalitions motivated by a variety of different interests and motives, uh, we also have to be kind of, we also have to bear in mind that um, some of the agendas of, of some of the parties who would be willing to agree to that uh, may bring about other things that, uh, that you know, you think are objectionable or unacceptable. So the, but the positive gloss is still, I don't think it would be the case that we would need actually to have climate um, change uh, to motivate people. And here are, here are some other reasons why people could be motivated. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there because it's just gone uh, 4 p.m. and 1 a.m. here for me. <laughs> but uh, <Hello>. Simon, <laughs> I want to say thank you so much. That was really engaging and really current. Um, and I wanted to say thank you uh, not only to all the other people that have uh, taken part in this series, uh, John Broom, Henry Shu, and Megan Blomfield, but most importantly to everyone that watch them and engage with them and ask questions. Uh, I've been really enjoying reading all of them and asking them and thank you very much. If you want to ask uh, or have a look at any of the talks that have gone before, you can find them on the Oxford Climate Society YouTube page. And I would just add, if anyone is looking for something to do in an hour's time, the Oxford Climate Society in collaboration with uh, the University of Oxford and The Guardian are running a week long uh, net zero homeschool. Uh, the third session today starts in an hour on nature uh, and land in net zero. So I highly recommend that. And that will be on the Oxford uh, Climate Society YouTube page as well. All right, well, thank you very much um, and enjoy your day. <laughs>